First, I would like to begin my program by thanking a few people. I would like to thank Ronnie Owens. Ronnie, would you raise your hand, please? Ronnie very generously loaned the Historical Society, the museum downtown, many artifacts that have been created by Vincent E. Valentine. This is Ronnie's uncle, and uh, Ronnie, uh, without hesitation, offered the Society the, the loan of wonderful, wonderful artifacts. Uh, also, I would like to introduce uh, Vincent Valentine the fourth. Uh, Vince, would you stand up? Vincent is the... grandson of Val Valentine, and it was through my chance meeting of Vince that I learned many details about Val and was able in the end to uh, write a book. Uh, when Vincent showed me Val's uh, scrapbooks, when I saw his, his books, I told Vince, I said, someone, someone needs to write this man's biography. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. Uh, I simply didn't know at the time that it would be me. <laughs> I would like to begin my presentation now. I want to point out on this initial screen that water had a formative effect on Val Valentine. You'll see that wherever he went throughout the states in his career, he was never very far from water, whether it was by plan or simply by the fact he just had an innate love of water, he was always very near water. I'll briefly tell you how the book came about. Uh, as a young man, I was an airbrush artist at Castle Dracula on Panama City Beach, and it was a wonderful job, probably the, the job that I've enjoyed more than any in my life. And over the years, uh, when Facebook came along, I thought, well, gee, you know, others probably would love Castle Dracula as much as I did, so I created a Facebook page called Castle Dracula on Panama City Beach. Well, it didn't get a lot of traction. There weren't that many people interested in uh, talking or discussing Castle Dracula. What they really wanted to talk about was old Panama City Beach, all the other things, in particular, Miracle Strip and Music Park. So I shifted, I changed the name of the Facebook page from Castle Dracula to Old Panama City Beach, and then I began to get all these questions about, well, what about... Dante's Inferno. What about the Abdominal Snowman? I couldn't answer those I questions. I began to do research so I could just simply answer a few questions. After I learned a little bit, I created a tribute video to Val Valentine, and that's the video that caught the attention of Vince the Fourth. He messaged me to say that he appreciated that I honored his granddad, and we began to talk, and Vince invited me to come to his house to see Val's scrapbooks which are simply unbelievable. He has a huge stack, and he saved everything. <laughs> everything. It's amazing. Simply amazing. What you'll see tonight, for the most part, are from Val's scrapbooks, but they're only a tiny fraction of what he was uh, saved in his scrapbooks. <laughs> I learned primarily from reading articles written about him. There were many, many, many publications written about Val because he was such an amazing artist, such a creative genius that uh, he was newsworthy. Val, Val was uh, born January the 27th, 1917, quite a long time ago. He was the third child of Vincent and Valentine Sr. and Olive Cockfair. His dad was a policeman. His mom was a housewife, and together they raised Vincent and his two sisters, Jeanette and Hope. Vincent was born in this small house in Queens, New York, and he lived there for most of his school days, up until the, the, the high school age, and then they moved to this home. Vince tells the story, in one of the publications, Vince tells the story that the greatest compliment that he ever got in his life was while he was in grade school. He was sitting at his desk one day and working on a little drawing that, and he had set it aside, but it was still on his desktop. One of his classmates came walking by and, and he said to Vince and said to Val, who drew that? And of course, Val looked proudly up and said, well, I did. And the boy shook his head, no, you didn't. Nobody can draw that good. <laughs> So that was, that he was called great. that his greatest compliment, and that may have been the moment that triggered him to set his mind to wanting to, to be an artist as a career. This house, though, however, is their summer home in Lindenhurst, New Jersey, 
and it was in the backyard of this house where Val really began to show his creative and his uh, um, fabrication ability because this book that you see on this slide, I mean, this book that you see on this slide is the Vin Ho Gene. It was built by Val with his own hands when he was 15 years old. Also, the illustration here on this screen was also by Val, and he did that when he was 15 as well. Here's a photograph of his boat just to show that he, in fact, did build it. He just didn't draw a photo, a picture of it. This is Jamaica High School. This is where Val went to high school in Queens, New York. The, the greatest thing that happened to Val while, while attending Jamaica High School was that he met his wife-to-be. Early in, in high school, he met Irene Mae Chowns, who would later become his wife. Irene and his paternal grandmother were Val's greatest supporters and encouraged him to uh, explore a career as an artist. I mean, Val took their advice. In the 11th grade, he applied to attend Cooper Union Art Institute. Now, if you're familiar with Cooper Union Art Institute, it's one of the oldest in the United States. It was founded by Peter Cooper, the, um, what's often considered um, America's first industrials. And the, in 1934, when Val began to attend Cooper Union, it was so exclusive that they permitted less than 10% of the applicants to go to school. Val made the cut. As a matter of fact, he made the cut while he was in the 11th grade. He skipped his senior year in high school so that he could attend Cooper Union. And I, I'd like to bring out a side note about the Cooper Union School. This is where President Lincoln gave his standout speech that most historians consider to be the speech that propelled him into the presidency. Also, there are quite a number of famous alumni that attended Cooper Union. Among them are Augustus St. Gaudens, Thomas Edison, Max Fleischer, a name that you will hear a lot more in just a moment. Also, Bob Kane, the creator of Batman, and Joe Oriolo. Joe Oriolo is probably a name that you won't recognize, but it happened to be Vince's best friend. And I'll, I'll, I'll flip through a couple of things that Val saved in his scrapbook. Of course, he, he saved his student card. He was provided with a, a card that allowed him to, to do sketching in the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is a photo of his graduating class. Uh, rather small, but uh, it was a highly exclusive school. This can be seen on the far right here. Next to him, holding a pipe, is Joe Oriola with his arm around Vincent. Vincent returned for a school reunion in 2005, representing the class of 1938. It's very likely that Vincent was the only remaining member of the class of 1938 in 2005. Uh, uh, Vince the fourth uh, accompanied his granddad to New York City for that reunion, and I'm sure it was a special occasion for Val. And I flipped through some, some sample artwork that Val did as a student at Cooper Union. You have to keep in mind now, this is art that was done by a teenager. And, and in, in his art, you can see the, uh, the art styles that were very popular at the time. And his very first job after graduating from school in 1938 was he got a job at the, uh, with the Lake Placid Players, a theater group in upstate New York. So he spent six weeks in upstate New York, and he kept his Social Security card that he was issued at the time. Later on in life, he added many annotations to the things that were in his scrapbook. This is one of the things that he annotated much later on while he was in his 90s. Notice that he remembered very well this particular event where he managed to make $5 a week and then he paid a total of 40 cents in Social Security withholding. <laughs> this is Val's best friend, Joe Oriolo. After Vincent graduated 
from school and after that summer job, which was basically just a summer hiatus, he knew he had to get a real job. Well, fortunately, his friend Joe told him that Max Fleischer was hiring folks in Miami. And uh, Joe had just gotten a job with the Fleischer brothers and he was moving to Miami and he suggested to Vince that he also apply for a job and, and move to Miami as well. In fact, Vince elects to do just that. He applies for a job with the Fleischer brothers. He's hired and he moves to Miami. Here's a picture of after he had arrived in Miami and working for the Fleischer brothers. There were two brothers, Max and Dave Fleischer, that, that created that company. And I'll, t I'll tell a brief aside regarding them. Um, Max Fleischer was somewhat of a genius himself. He invented the rotoscope camera and also became a, a, an active animator as well. He, he was the uh, animator of the Popeye and Olive Oil cartoons, Betty Boop, and many others. Well, Walt Disney took that rotoscope camera, uh, went to California with it, and built an empire. This, this slide is straight out of Val's scrapbook. This, this sheet is called a model sheet, and all of the artists in the Fosher Studios were provided with these uh, model sheets Val had one for Popeye, Olive Oil, Wimpy, Betty Boop. He had one for all of the, the Flasher, Flasher Brothers characters. Here's a photo of him and his fellow uh, uh, animators taking a lunch break in the heat in Miami, playing a, a friendly game of football. The last project that Val worked on for the Flasher Brothers was Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels came out shortly after Snow White did. Snow White was the very first feature-length animation. Uh, the folks at Paramount wanted to, to cash in on it. They, uh, they put the Flasher Brothers on a fast track to produce Gulliver's Travels. On Gulliver's Travels, Val became a hands expert. He was very often called upon to fix problems with hands in the, in the animation process. So, if when you see any illustrations of Gulliver, you, you can count on him having nice looking hands. <laughs> While in Miami, Irene joined Val and they were married while living in Miami. Val noted in his scrapbook that these were his happiest times. One thing about the Fleischer brothers is they didn't get along well. Dave and Max fought a lot. So not only were the Flasher brothers hard to get along with each other, they were also under a tremendous uh, demand, uh, time demand that, that they get out the Gulliver's Travels as quickly as possible. So I'm sure that working for uh, the Flasher brothers at that period in time was fairly undesirable. So before uh, Gulliver Travels was complete, Val quit and returned to New York City in the fall of 1941. In the fall of 1941, he got a job with Fairchild Camera and Instrument Corporation. There he became the art director and he guided the publication of their in-house in publications and the advertising that they did in trade journals at, at this same time in 1941, as we all know, in December, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. On that occasion, Val went straight to the Navy recruiting office and he volunteered to join the submarine service. Well, the, when the recruiters learned who he was working for and what his job was, he was refused. A number of times, Val would go to the recruiting office to try to join the Navy, and each and every time he was told that his services were more important to the nation in his civilian position, and he remained in that position throughout the war. Here's a, um, this image is, you can see Val and Irene are attending a, a social event uh, uh, with his co-workers. This advertisement is typical of, of what Val would compose for the magazine, which he of course, was in charge of. The, um, this is a letter of commendation, uh, not from his supervisor, but from the president of the company. 
This slide is an indicator of the kinds of illustrations he would do for morale and safety. Uh, the, the illustration on the right with the girls sitting at the drill press, uh, uh, at the bottom, uh, it's probably too difficult to read. Well, maybe you can, but that's Val's uh, attempt at poetry, which is actually quite good. And later on, you'll see where he uses poetry again and again uh, in his artwork. War footing. Well, at the end of the war, he was let go. So Joe Oriola had also returned to New York City at the time. And for a brief period of time, they hooked back up as Oriolo, Valentine, and Associates. And they picked up some work around New York City. Uh, uh, this, this is an example of the type of stuff that they were doing at the time. At the time, while they were satisfying their, their, their comic book client, they were tossing around the idea about a little friendly ghost that Val would name Casper. And, and that, because, since they were both ex-animators, they thought that they might try their hands at a little animation. And Casper, of course, probably would have been the very first thing that they did. The catch was, while discussing the topic of Casper the Friendly Ghost, Val got the sad news that his son, Vincent Valentine III, had rheumatic fever, and the doctor informed the family that they would have to move to a warmer climate. So Val bid goodbye to Joe Oriolo. He packed his family up and moved back to Florida. Actually, Irene and Val were not terribly upset about moving back to Florida. They had lived there, of course, in Miami, and they had seen the opportunities in the tourist trade, the burgeoning tourist trade that was occurring at the time, and they were, I don't think they were unhappy at all to go back to Florida. So they packed up a travel trailer, much like the one you see here on this slide, attached it to the back of their 1934 Hudson Terraplane, and made their way back to Florida. At the time, there was a polio epidemic that was in, occurring in many places throughout the states, and that was the reason they elected to take a travel trailer rather than take public transportation back down to Florida. And once they got to Florida, a Val would, would stop in each and every county and drop off a resume at the county school office. Well, by the time he made it down to Ocala in Marion County, he uh, was offered a job with the Marion County at the Marion County Vocational School. And for two years, Val taught commercial art at the Vocational School. While he was teaching the class, he was working on quite a number of freelance projects at the same time. And of course, it was plain to see he would make far more money as a sign painter than he would as a school teacher. So after two years, he quit teaching school and, and was operating a, a, a sign shop full time. And notice how at the same time, <laughs> while, while he was uh, painting signs in Ocala, he came to the attention of Harold Peel. Harold Peel was a publisher and a promoter, a very prominent publisher and promoter in Ocala at the time. And he, among his clients were folks that operated tourist businesses in the Silver Springs area. Um, prominent among those folks at Silver Springs were Ross Allen and Tommy Bartlett. Ross Allen and Tommy Bartlett were very large roles in Val Valentine's career. Here we see an example on the love of a sign that, that Val created for Ross Allen. And at the top, top, top portion of that frame, you see where Val has created a Santa sleighing with reindeer. I can tell that Val uh, used his abundant airbrush skills to paint the deer on the, on the side of that uh, trail. Ross and Allen was a famous herpetologist, as they're called, and he opened the Ross Allen Institute in Silver Springs in 1929. He was quite famous. He was the most prominent satellite attraction of Silver Springs. Tommy Bartlett was, was famous in his own right. Tommy Bartlett was the Johnny Carson of Chicagoland TV 
back in the early 50s when television was first getting started tommy bartlett was on radio and tv on cbs and nbc at the same time so he had the chicago land well covered the tourists traveling down from the midwest as they drove down through the central florida they couldn't help but recognize the name tommy bartlett one of the shows that he had on his television program was a skiing troupe Tommy became so excited by the skiing troupe and the potential for profit that they had that he decided that he would quit being a radio and TV personality and go into the tourist business. So he bought some property in Wisconsin Dells and he created his very own water ski show. So Tommy Bartlett employed Val in Silver Springs and also he called Val to join him up in Wisconsin as well, in the Midwest. You see examples of Val's work where he was helping Tommy with his deer ranch in Silver Springs. Now, Val was a sign painter, so he put his talents to good use for, for Tommy Bartlett. And, of course, as you, you can well imagine, if you've ever visited a roadside deer park, that they're not particularly entertaining, but Val was able to take it to the next level in the most creative fashion. As a matter of fact, I, very, I, I don't expect there were many deer ranches that had Del, <laughs> Del Mar the Dancing Bantam. Now that's actually, that's a pretty good trick. Those animals were, were trained in Arkansas and the way they trained those chickens to dance was by using a hot plate. Please don't tell anybody. <laughs> Please don't tell anybody that. But, uh, it shouldn't leave this room. So Tommy's water skiing show blew up, and, and, and so as he began to help Tommy Bartlett in the Midwest, Val came to the attention of other tourist attraction owners in Wisconsin and other states as well. And, and I think this is where Val did some of his very best postal work. When you look at this, this is amazing. The quality of this is simply top-notch. It's superb. It's just beautifully done. Uh, Fort Dells was a, a, a fort that was a tourist attraction in the area there. He did work for them as well. The Enchanted Forest. Now, keep in mind, this is wood. This is sign work that Val did for the entrance to the Enchanted Forest. It's absolutely astounding. And here's his work that he did. Well, this is, of course, the same place, but... In addition to having an enchanted forest, they also had a prehistoric land. Here's another location that probably didn't have quite the same budget called Storybook Gardens in basically the same neighborhood. And there was something that Val did while he was there that he would repeat many times again, and that's a haunted house. Here in this photo, you see Val revealing his sketch for a haunted house that he proposed to build at Fort Dells. And, and the lower portion of the photo is, is the haunted house that Val built. Val would employ devices that the visitor touring the, the haunted house themselves would trip these devices and cause the visitor to scare themselves without having to employ the use of actors to jump out and shout boo. In 1963, Ross thought it was a good time that he expand his operation and he thought Panama City Beach would be just the perfect place to do it. So in 1963, Ross built a roadside zoo right next to the amusement park going up at the time called Miracle Strip Amusement Park. So everything was going really well for Ross and his, he called it Ross Allen's Jungle Show on Panama City Beach. In this photo at the lower left corner, you can see his, his zoo. In front of the zoo near the roadside, you can see his street sign. The first time that Val Valentine came to Panama City was to install the street sign that he had created for Ross Island. Ross Island got some bad news shortly after opening up his uh, roadside zoo, his jungle show on Panama City Beach. The new owners of Silver Springs, which was ABC Paramount, decided that they didn't want a competing jungle show with Ross Island's primary jungle show at Silver Springs. So they forced Ross Allen to sell it. But Ross Allen was in a jam. 
nobody wanted to buy us. Every potential buyer knew that there was only a 100-day season on Panama City Beach, and you had to feed those animals 365 days a year. That was a money-losing proposition, so we had no buyers whatsoever, with one exception. That exception was Vincent Valentine. He, he Vince saw the possibility. <laughs> Vince knew that if he only had a hook, he could make Jungle Land profitable. For the very first year, he just simply ran the, the, the roadside zoo just the way Ross Allen had left it. And he was forced, of course, to change the name of it, and he changed it to Jungle Land as, to, as opposed to Ross Allen's Jungle Shows. And these are some photos that Val took and included in his scrapbook. Val, he knew he had to put together a business plan, a winning business plan that would allow him to turn the zoo into a success. In order to make that happen, though, he had to take a stroll just a few hundred yards west and visit Lee Coughlin at Goofy Golf. And once he strolled around Goofy Golf, I think Val had an epiphany. I think he saw how he would be able to have his hook that would draw tourists off the street and into the parking lot of Jungle Land. And I think what Val wanted to do, at the time there was something new in tourism, and that was called an immersive experience. Walt Disney was the first to explore providing an immersive experience to his visitors at Disneyland in California. So that's what Val wanted to do on Panama City Beach. And once he saw what Lee Coughlin had done at Jungle Land, he knew he used the same technique. And rather than build dinosaurs and alligators, he would in fact build a volcano. That's precisely what he did. He began building the volcano in, 19, in 1965, at the end of the 1965 season, through that winter, and he opened it in the spring of 1966. Here's Val and workers in their construction process. The hook that he wanted to attract tourists was Journey to the Center of the Earth. The magazine that you see, this photograph in the center top, in that magazine, Val tells the story of how he managed to finance Jungle Land. Val didn't have a lot of money at that time. As a matter of fact, the zoo was rapidly exhausting his savings account. So he had to come up with a, a, an innovative way. He had, to, he had to think out of the box when it came to financing. And he came up with this idea, a rather audacious idea, and what he decided to do was to go next door and ask his nearest competitor for the money. <laughs> that seems like a screwball idea, but that is in fact what he did. The, in this story, Val tells where he showed James Lark, the owner of River Strip and Music Park, his plans. He had been working on it a very long time. He had very well-developed plans. When James looked at his plans, he said to Val, Val, did you draw all this? And he said, yes, I did. And then he said, well, we're not a bank. We're not in the business of loaning money. I'm not really sure that we'll be able to help you. And uh, then, of course, Val thanked him and said, well, please keep in mind. Well, James Lark was not one that would quickly make up his mind. In fact, he was more inclined to do his homework. So what James did was to drive up to the Midwest, to the Chicago area. He went to um, the, many of the places that Val had created, and then he came back. But part of the deal that Val suggested to James was that if he would provide the money, which he was asking for, $100,000, $100,000 in 1964 was a lot of money. So part of the deal for the $100,000 was that after Jungle Land was complete, after the volcano was built, James Lark would become the owner of the property of Jungle Land and the zoo. And the, all that Val wanted in return for having constructed it 
was he wanted space to build a haunted house on the grounds of the amusement park. Well, Mr. Lark went to, to, to view the, many of the things that he built. He, he looked at the, the, uh, the haunted house that he had built at Fort Dells and made up his mind. He came back to Panama City Beach and he gave about $100,000 to build Jungle Land. The, he evidently felt very confident and Val was worthy of his trust because the construction costs of Jungle Land was paid off in 100 days of the very first season of operation. Uh, in 1967, the Florida uh, the Development Commission decided that they would promote Panama City Beach. They would engage in an international promotion. Uh, a really big deal at the time because Panama City Beach had never had a, a national, uh, nationwide or international promotion at the time. So a, a, a professional photographer was hired and the, the photographer recruited four recent graduates from Bay High School to serve as models for the photography for the promotion of all of the tourist attractions on Panama City Beach at the time. Melody May was one of the four that joined to serve as models for the promotion. She right away became the favorite. Even today uh, is, is fondly remembered by many people. And I wanted to include uh, photos of her in the story because she really was a big part of the success of Jungle Land at the time. Well, Val got what he wanted with the, the haunted house at, at Miracle Strip Amusement Park, and he gave his new haunted house the name Old House. And he repeated what he had learned. Well, I left out a bit of the story earlier. Not only did he build a singular haunted house in the Midwest, but in fact, he built three more haunted houses in the Midwestern region over the years while he was working up there. In 1967, Val opened Old House. Here are a few photographs of Old House under construction. And in the center, of course, is Mr. Jones, the star of Old House. Initially, Mr. Jones walked around the, the, the widow's walk on top of Old House, but I think within a couple of years, Val realized that he was too far away from folks uh, down in the, uh, uh, on the grounds to see exactly what that was. So he brought him down to a, a lower level in, in this photograph. You can see as Mr. Jones uh, makes his circuit on the upper deck, well, on the first floor actually, uh, uh, on the, over the porch of Old House. And again, uh, uh, Val takes an opportunity to demonstrate his uh, poetry and writes a limerick telling the story of Mr. Jones, the, the ghost of Old House. Okay, now, Val had hit a home run with Jungle Land. With Old House, he had done exactly the same thing. Old House had paid for the cost of construction in the very first season of operation. Mr. Mark came to Val and said, can you hit it out of the park one more time? He said, I've got this old ride called Hour 13. And when the cars go through the, and these old rides were called dark rides, and they still are called dark, this type of ride called a dark ride. And he said, uh, when the cars go through the dark ride, they're only half full now. What can you do to, to when, fix when that? The, As you can see in the photo on the lower right, when it first opened up, there were lines of people waiting to ride Hour 13. Well, five years later, that wasn't the case. So Val said, yeah, I think I got a bag of tricks that I can draw from. And he came up with Haunted Castle. He totally revamped the outside of Hour 13. And, and I like to think that he called back on his days as an illustrator, as an animator for Popeye. I think you can see some old spooky trees from a Popeye cartoon in that tree that, that became the cornerstone of the haunted castle. The visitors actually had to walk up and through and inside the old tree in order to, to get on the cars to ride through the dark ride. 
the the dark ride went from a ride that was half empty sometimes to one that was always full with lines waiting to to ride. So at this point in time, Mark is convinced of Valentine's abilities to take failing attractions, failing rides, and rejuvenate them uh, by adding the Val Valentine magic. So he, he, at this point, he offers Val a job. And I think Val had come to the age where he was no longer uh, eager to travel to the Midwest to work on projects out of the state. So Val agreed to become an employee of the amusement park. And in that capacity, the next thing that he did was the abominable snowman. And I'm the abominable snowman took the scrambler ride, and you can see that in the photo. Now the scrambler ride was suffering the very same thing. Half the time that it was operated, there was only a few people in the seats. Uh, Mr. Lark asked Val, what can you do to fix that one? He said, well, I've got an idea. I said, why don't we uh, put the ride in an igloo and set a gigantic Yeti on top? And of course, that sounded like a great idea. And that's precisely what they did. And that actually became a trend. The, the, they, the, air, the air conditioning within the abominable snowman was turned down very low. So people during the summer would go ride the abominable snowman and find it so very refreshing that they would get out and get back in line again. <laughs> so Val once again has proven his worth as a designer of arc, uh, amusement rides. And he's asked again if he can duplicate the magic one more time. In this case, Val goes the uh, thermal opposite. He decided to flip the theme on his head, and he took this old ride called the Trabant, suffering the same problem as the Scrambler. Same thing happening. What can you do to fix it? Well, Val says, why don't we build a devil's head? on top of that ride. And this slide is photos of Val in the construction phase of b building Dante's Inferno. In my personal opinion, I think Dante's Inferno is Val's finest example of art. Now, don't get me wrong, Shipwreck Island has some wonderful pieces, and Haunted Castle, of course, is, is, is beautiful as well. but. For me, the, the, the degree of refinement and finish that was on Dante's Inferno is just simply exceptional. And it, of course, was just as successful. Uh, it went from a ride being empty most of the time to a ride that was, there were lines, queues out front waiting to ride. Glee Copeland that we met earlier in my presentation, of course, was knew Val very well, and it was watching the success that he was having at Miracle Strip Amusement Park. And, and I'm not really sure who pitched it to the other, but Glee Copeland and Val Valentine team up to work on Mysterious Mansion. Lee owned some property in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, so Lee and Val, of course, Val being the one to design and build the uh, Mysterious Mansion. In 1981, Val completed the Mysterious Mansion using the same formula that he had done many times before, but you can tell from the photographs in his last one, the, he actually stepped his game up even greater than he had ever done before. The refinement was is simply exceptional. Adding to the effect was visitors had to step across a bridge to enter Mysterious Mansion in Gatlinburg. Uh, the, the Mysterious Mansion is still in the Coughlin family today. It's still operated by Lisa Coughlin. And uh, now we'll shift to Shipwreck Island. But we have to step back in time from 1981. We got to step back just a little bit to 1977 for Shipwreck Island. And here I want to tell you the story that, that was told to me by Buddy Wilkes when I interviewed him. 
Um, but he said that uh, the subordinates of uh, um, Mr. Lark, James Lark, had a good idea that Mr. Lark should build a water slide at Miracle Circle Amusement Park. So they called a meeting with uh, uh, Mr. Lark, and they were all sitting around his desk, and they began to tell him about their idea. And he was listening, and, uh, and of course they were describing all the features that, that, that they would want to have. And he asked them, well, gee, how, how much is this water slide going to cost? And uh, when they told them, Mr. Lark stood up and rather impolitely asked them to leave his office. But true to Mr. Lark's nature, he didn't toss the idea aside. In fact, Mr. Lark got on an airplane and went to California. He went to Lake Dolores in California to check out a water slide that was already in place in California. When Mr. Lark visited there, he saw that there was, in fact, potential for a water slide on his property on Panama City Beach. So he, he went back and asked Val to design a water slide. And that's precisely what he did. Val designed and constructed Zoom Flume. Not only did he design and build it, but he named it as well. So he uh, proved to be poetic once again. In 1980, they expanded to include uh, bumper boats and a, a small pool. And they gave it the name of What a Water Wonder World. I struggle to say it every time. And, but thank goodness, by 1983, they came to their senses and renamed it Shipwreck Island. And this is when Val got really busy at Shipwreck Island. Here's an example of some of his work under construction where he builds a, a small-scale Spanish sailing ship. And there were many others. And as a matter of fact, today, the only examples of Val Valentine's work that's left that I know of, there may be small pieces of it in other locations, the only place that I know of locally remains today at Shipwreck Island. It became Val's last project. Even though he kept a workshop on the grounds at, at the amusement park in the 90s, he slowly began to retire at, at this point in time. And in the late 90s, Val and Irene moved to Tallahassee, Florida to live near their children. Of course, the saddest day in Val, Val Valentine's life <clears throat> was the day his wife Irene died. She died on November the 21st, 2002. And after his wife died, Val elects to move to Snellville, Georgia to live near his granddaughter. And at that time, Val comes full circle in his career because he begins as a retiree living in a retirement community. He nevertheless volunteers to support a local uh, theater group. And these are some examples of some of the work that he did in his 90s so it's absolutely amazing it honestly is the quality of the man's work throughout his career was superb and, and it's fair to say second to none so the legacy of val valentine val was written up in articles numerous articles far too many to include in this presentation tonight on this slide, you see a number of articles at the top. That magazine on the right is Amusement Business. Making the cover of Amusement Business is the same thing of a rock and roll artist making the cover of the Rolling Stone. It was that important, and he made it. He was on the cover. The rest of those are letters of commendations that he received from clients throughout the years. Again, far too many to include in this presentation tonight. I'm sure most of you are familiar with YouTube. And when you're searching around YouTube, YouTube watches what you're doing. They have a really good idea of the things that you're interested in. And not only do they know it, but they'll make suggestions as to something that you might be interested in. And I did this screenshot one day because as I was flipping around YouTube, 
they thought that I would be interested in seeing a video about the abominable snowman. Well, it caught my attention, but not because I'd never seen the abominable snowman before, but I began to look at the number of views the competing videos had gotten. And on this page, the abominable snowman is the winner. <laughs> Val legacy is strong. I want to tell the story about David Smith. David Smith's the young man <clears throat> that took this video. David Smith grew up in Birmingham. He wanted to take a pilgrimage to visit the man that had thrilled him, enthralled him so completely as a child. So he packed up and drove over 400 miles to visit Val in the retirement home. And that's David and his sister there. This, that encapsulates Val Valentine's legacy, that someone would drive so far to see him in person. And of course, he managed to capture Val and sketching Popeye. So to the end of his life, Val maintained a creative spirit. At the, at the end of his life, the end of his odyssey, that was the end of the Odyssey of the Enchanter. Thank you very much.